welcome. This is just the first message so that it starts. I'll be ready in just a minute. Ah, wonderful. There we go. So, what we're going to do today is we're going to cover these topics. My episode format has not changed yet, so, so far this has worked. It is um, cover first listener feedback, which I don't have any today, so we're, that's going to be quick. Cybersecurity news. I do a how-to instructional, which will be short, and then a website tool of the week, which is also short. The biggest part of it is the cybersecurity news. I have about six articles to cover, plus I'd like to review two uh, videos that I found on YouTube that I found very helpful and informative, so I'll share them with you. Hopefully I'm coming in clear, loud and clear. I seem to have uh, green lights, so I'm going to trust that it works. My recording also worked. I tested just a few minutes ago, so hopefully it will be okay, but we'll uh, proceed. We'll proceed like it is until I know otherwise. So let's begin uh, bringing up my notes here, which would be very helpful. But also where I can see chat. How about that? All right. Okay. Let's get started. So the first article I'd like to cover, well, as I said, there's no listener feedback. If you'd like to send me feedback, it's laurenmj at gmail.com. So just my name on Twitter and YouTube, laurenmj at gmail.com. So feel free to give me a like, a follow, cover me on whatever social media that you'd like, and uh, connect with me on Twitter, lmj underscore ou, and check me out. Uh, send me some feedback, and I'd be happy to read it and cover it and answer it and apply it if it's uh, something good. I've been able to apply a couple of uh, interesting feedback from the first and second episode, so hopefully I will continue that nice pattern of how that's going. With that, let's get to the next part, which is the cybersecurity news. And on this note, uh, we're going to start with this article, which I really enjoyed. It's uh, The Hunt for the Dark Web's Biggest Kingpin, Part 1, The Shadow, by Andy Greenberg, uh, he works for Wired Magazine. The thing I loved about Wired's style of cybersecurity articles is the storytelling. They have a captivating well way of telling a story. So it's in sort of a format of a story. So it'll begin with, um, I should first say that this is the first of a two-part series on, ex on how exactly the authorities were able to capture the operator of the largest online illegal drug, drug operation um, that was executed over the dark web, dark net, or the tour, tour network, how, whatever you want to call it. It's all the same. Dark web, dark net, tour network. Those are pretty much synonymous. So this is the person who took over the top spot of uh, the dark web's largest retailer of uh, drugs, Ill illicit drugs, after uh, Silk Road was destroyed by authorities. Silk Road was eventually uh, brought down. So this group of cyber criminals that operate over the dark web have learned and applied the lessons learned from Silk Road. You might say that this is um, Silk Road 2.0, although it's called uh, Alpha Bay, um, sort of a play off eBay, but they sell illicit drugs. So you have to get on the dark web. You have to search for that or go to their website on the dark web and you can buy your own drugs. That was the idea. The story starts with introducing the law enforcement professionals who started working on it and where they came from. Which, incidentally, they were not involved in cyber crimes at first. They weren't people that focused necessarily on cyber crime. They're just normal detectives and they happen to get into cyber crime. 
um, pulled in from other departments, which I found that to be very interesting because they just were not involved at first in cybercrimes. They used a lot of typical investigative procedures, as they would, being a good detective. They used tools and operations that were not cyber to start with. The goal at first was, uh, and this is a quote, they would be going after individual money launderers and drug dealers, not kingpins and masterminds. So their start was to just get the little guys, and then they would work their way up. That's a typical detective, you know, real in real life, IRL uh, mode of investigative work is to do that, to start with that. Then you work your way up as you gain informants and are able to infiltrate an organization, a criminal organization. Miller, who's our hero of the authorities, uh, was ready to go back into real police work. Apparently he had um, basically an accident that caused him some physical harm. Although he wanted to get into the other things like SWAT type of activity, he couldn't. He was given a desk job due to injury. And that, fortunately, led him to get this case. And he was finally able to get a breakthrough tip and this happened just at the end of this particular first part. So this first part is basically introducing all the characters. Uh, it's a pretty long article, but it's uh, a, a lot of it's about um, Alpha 2, Alpha Zero 2, which is the person that they're after. And of course, our hero, Robert Miller, who was able to, um, who's basically trying to bring down this um, the Silk Road 2 Alpha Bay. So it talks about uh, who we're talking about and what their initial goals were and then what was happening in the market at the time and how big they got and how they did get big and how they how they changed from silk road to alpha bay so they basically learned a lot unfortunately it um it ends it only has two chapters and so this is part one i believe it is part there is a part two and according to I think that's already actually up, but uh, we'll have to get to that maybe the next episode. So I'll just cover this episode for now. You can take a you can take a read on it, see if it's interesting to you. If it gets if it continues to be interesting all the way out to the six parts, I'll um, I'll keep covering it. But so far, I'm really enjoying this, and uh, y you might too if you're into cybersecurity. This is basically where the good guys win, and uh, how they did it. So uh, part two, they're going to continue the trail and pick up the trail there. So, I, like I said, I love the storytelling part of it. So it's it's very good to see what the authorities do, how they work, and uh, this could could help people that are in cybersecurity to learn what um, you know how the authorities operate, what they're looking for, and how they work. I either way, it's a win. So let's go to the next article. The next article that I want to cover is uh, Google warns all Mac users to patch this high risk. Chrome security flaw. This is by Michael Simon from Macworld. So following an update or patch from iOS 16.1, which was pretty famous and happened last week, and you should be running on 16.1 now, there is now a new flaw following that patch that specifically is in Chrome for iOS. Uh, the CVE data is... Mm, let me just show that here real quick. It's here. There it is right there. So there is the CVE data if you want to look it up yourself. Uh, it uses a type confusion bug and results in an out-of-bounds memory access. So this allows an attacker to actually leave the sandboxed environment of an app on your iOS device and to be able to access memory from another place or even uh, cause a crash or execute arbitrary code to take advantage of the device. So as it says, be on this version or higher uh, when you check your Chrome. So in Chrome, go to Preferences, About Chrome, and then check for update. Make sure you're running at least 107.0.5304.87 or higher. What I want to talk about next is um, a couple of articles that are on the same sort of topic. It's about copyright, and I'm seeing this more and more. Uh, I even enjoyed a copyright uh, cyber cybersecurity training seminar that I was I was at today that talked about trademarks, trade secrets, uh, which is an adjacent topic to copyright. It is based on the idea that a company or a person owns something, right? It's not it's not a real asset that you can go and touch. It's not a brick and mortar building. 
It's not an asset like a car or technology. It's a trade secret. A trade secret would be secret sauce, like a mixture, an element, or a process that creates the core technology of a company's product. So think um, think about Coke. You know, Coke has a Coke has a specific number of ingredients, and the mixture and amounts of those combinations of ingredients are the trade secret, right? So if you could get access to that, well, then you could make your own Coke, and that would be to the detriment of Coke. Now, the, the elements in the process are probably not um, the secret. In other words, the ingredients aren't necessarily secret. Anyone could probably get these ingredients, but how are they mixed? How are they combined? How are they cooked? Uh, you know, how, how do they put together? Together, and what amounts? Um, the combinations are also important. So that would be a trade secret. A trademark is different. It is a recognizable connection to ownership. For example, um, let's talk about Coke. Coke has that uh, swish on it, right? The Coke swish, a little uh, white banner with a red background. And of course, the name Coke, C-O-K-E, C-O-K-E. Yeah. So you need to understand that the bottle that you've picked up or the bottle that you purchased from the store, it is it contains Coke, right? You want it to contain Coke. So what would it be if you opened it and it didn't contain Coke? Well, there'd be a problem, wouldn't it? So brand recognition is very important. Uh, so if it has the swish and has the Coke name on it, then you're picking up a Coke. And uh, that's an important. It's the same for uh, well-known brands like Nike, Adidas, any other place that has a online presence or a public presence in society and wants that presence to be respected and to be used as a recognizable brand. Uh, there is an explosion of fake materials online that you can get that um, are duplicating or faking a very high-end expensive items. So I don't think of Coke as a high-end or expensive item, but if you could make your own Coke or if you made a fake Coke, well then you could, could be well on your way to being rich, but Coke would have reason to, of course, litigate you. A person who wants to deal or help with these topics would have to be in a cybersecurity position because that's that's where that's how it happens, right? If things are shared over on over the internet online, uh, you can typically order it from there or whatever. So let's talk about these specific cases now that I've introduced the concept of copyright and how it differs from trademark trade secret. So IKEA has demanded that this uh, developer change his horror game. So he's created a horror game and it happens in a furniture store. So the article comes from uh, videogameschronicle.com by Chris Scullion. Uh, the title is, Ikea has demanded an indie dev change his infinite furniture store horror game. The idea here is that um, Ikea does not like this game. And the reason they don't like this game is twofold. One, if you can see the screen, you can see how the opening of the game, the, the content in the game, the, the, um, the artwork in the game, you can see how it looks like an Ikea store, right? So uh, just, to, just to check that, I've, um, I brought up pictures here. Um, let's see. Okay, so here is a picture from the game, right? Here's the opening picture from the game on the left. So it's, it's obviously at night, but um, you see a building, square, very square building. With um, a par from a parking lot perspective, you can see this building. It has lights above the name of the store. The name of the store is four letters, and it's in very tall white. Uh, I'm not sure what font that would be, but probably a Times Roman font. So you can kind of see that it um, very much looks like the image to the right, which is a picture of a real IKEA store, which of course has the trademark uh, blue building with the very tall white or very tall yellow uh, lettering and of course ikea is four letters so the store name may be different but it's quite obvious that this game developer is taking the idea of ikea and making it the setting of this horror game so the developer of um this uh well, the studio is called Ziggy, and it, and it has basically has one one developer, which is Jacob Shaw. Uh, he has to um, 
Well, he made this game on, on Kickstarter. The game is called uh, The Store is Closed. Because it's on Kickstarter, well, it's, it's still being developed. In fact, uh, <laughs> as of the recording of this, uh, this podcast or this um, cybersecurity show, it, it actually has only a few um, hours left in it. Actually, let me click that and see how many hours they have left. It's going to be today. See, 16 hours to go. So they have made their target. They, in fact, they've made probably about four times their target. Um, and it has 16 hours to go. Unfortunately, with the legal problems he's about to have, uh, he, uh, I'm not quite sure how that will affect this. But basically, he's been funded. And of course, it has a lot of problems with this. Um, they've demanded that uh, he change. It, it isn't sort of a... Which, which I think is kind of interesting, that the store has a problem with this, of course, but they request that he change the game. In other words, don't take down the game, don't kill your game, don't stop everything. It's more like, you can do this, just change your game. So I thought that was an interesting uh, approach from the, from the victim, in this case. Uh, the complaint is, and I, I'm just quoting, it says, uh, your game uses a blue and yellow sign with a Scandinavian name, a Scandinavian name on the store. A blue box-like building, yellow vertical striped shirts identical to those worn by IKEA personnel, a gray path on the floor. So this is inside the store. You need, when you see the personnel and you see the fixtures, like the floor, um, it also shows furniture that looks like IKEA furniture and product signage that looks like IKEA signage. The author says, and I'm quoting here too, I bought generic furniture assets packs to make this game. So uh, I guess that's an answer to part of that. Um, it doesn't answer all of it, of course. But uh, the author, uh, at the end here, he laments, I was going to spend the last week of my Kickstarter preparing an update for all the new alpha testers, but now I've got to desperately revamp the entire look of the game so I don't get sued. Yep. That is what you will have to do. Now, even if you use standard or purchased assets within a game development platforms, you still need to be careful that you don't bring to life another person's creation. This developer essentially created a virtual IKEA as the environment for his horror game. Now, he changed the name, but that's not good enough. He basically created this environment in the game, and now he's paying the price for it. He'll have to revamp his, his game. Now, the second article is very much like this. It is a s very similar problem. Um, and it is uh, from PC Gamer. The article is titled, Amsterdam Hotel Could Take Legal Action Over Appearance in Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 by Jonathan Bolding from PC Gamer. So the complaint is that this conservatorium hotel is undesirably the scene of... Uh, it's a scene in the game Call of Duty. So, um, and I'm going to quote here. More generally, we don't support games that seem to encourage the use of violence. The game in no way reflects our core values and regret we regret our apparent and unwanted involvement. So the author... It, Interesting, he compares um, a couple of other instances of this happening before in games. One is the depiction of Manchester Cathedral in Resistance, Fall of Anne. Also, back in 2006, uh, there was... Uh, no, that was back in 2006. There's also um, a lawsuit about the Humvee being used. Of course, that's an American military brand. Um, well, it's called H. MMV if it's used by the military, but people say Humvee, and uh, it's, of course it's a vehicle. It's com commonly used by the American military, but you see these Humvees in all kinds of games, and of course uh, that is not legal, so you may run into some problems. Now, it, do it has happened that certain uh, weapons appear in games, and that too has come to become a problem. Uh, however, it's a different problem. Um, one of them was, uh, let's see, a Microsoft game that came out that sh that 
actually has a a real gun in it uh, that that it has been duplicated and put in the game, and it was done with the permission of the makers of that weapon, and it came to their downfall later because they were basically training people to use their weapon in a game for children, so it became a problem. Um, the lawsuit. I like this quote too. The lawsuit may seem flippant to many, but architecture is copyrightable under both European and American law. As a five-star luxury hotel, it's possible that the owners and manager of the consortium desire absolute control over their business depiction. I thought this article, while it was similar, I found it interesting on its own because it has a moral component to it. The saying of, we don't support games that do this or do that. I found interesting. So if you look at this article, uh, he he says undesirably, undesirably, this has become a scene in Call of Duty. So the owners of this luxury hotel, of course, do not like this game. Um, so it's it's become a problem for them because of the content of the game being associated with their hotel. So it's a violent game. It's violent, destructive, and they in no way want to be part of that. So um, they have a case here. It could could work out. So um, we'll see how those things go. Definitely not something you want to do. Um, I mean, be be if you're not, if you're a developer, be very generic when you use assets. Build your own assets. Do not take advantage of others' assets. Um, that. Uh, could very much look like something in the real world. Even if you purchase those assets, the owners of the asset or the people who made it could be violating copyright and just don't know because they've just they've just made this asset and then put it online. Uh, the owners of a particular store or brand that the that that asset is meant to copy or look like may not have seen it yet. So possible you could find yourself in some trouble in any case uh, it's wise to limit your use of these things as well as you know creating your own assets possibly and also staying far away from anything in the real world um, other than just a hint of it so I mean you could have done any five-star hotel or you could have changed the front or changed the layout or changed the colors you know you could have made a bunch of changes and people would still feel like well maybe this is probably that hotel but it would be obviously very different when it came to execution of, like, if you compared them side by side, as opposed to this side by side comparison we made here uh, with this. I mean, this is just, wow. I mean, that is, you, you, can't, you can't argue with this. This is uh, very much a copyright violation in this case. So just something you want to understand. So uh, moving on, let's go to our next article. Now this one I thought was interesting because of the way it, it's, well, let's get to it first. So uh, um, new, as a mo new as of data wiper tries to frame researchers and bleeping computer by Lawrence Abrams of bleeping computer. So there is this, basically there's this new and destructive ransomware. It's called as of ransomware. It is a data wiper. So it leaves behind a ransom note. And in this ransom note, it claims to have been created by well-known security researcher named Hasherazadi and lists other researchers. And uh, it includes the article's author, Lawrence Abrams. It also says bleeping computer. As if these people and this group, that company, bleeping computer, is involved in the operation of this ransomware. Uh, the ransom note, it was named restore underscore files dot text, and it says that this these devices have been encrypted due to the pro protest of the seizure of Crimea, and because Western countries are not doing enough to help Ukraine. So um, that's what they're claiming. It it is interesting here the f the framing because you haven't seen I have never seen this before. Maybe this is the first time I'm seeing it, but to actually list in your um, in your authors, well, you can see it here. It says, "Hello, my name is Hasheris. I am the Polish, I am the Polish security expert. 
to recover your files, contacts us in, in, Twitter, in Twitter, and it names all of these people, all these security researchers, as well as Bleeping Computer, which of course is misspelled, but well, that might be that might be spelled correctly. I'm not sure if Bleeping Computer has a G in it in their uh, Twitter handle. I'm not sure. But in any case, uh, it, it goes on to say, you know, you must pay for your files to be returned and such. But uh, how interesting, right? Uh, so this article goes on to, to talk about what we know about it, what they, what they know about the um, data wiper, uh, and of course, hopefully some ways to get out of it. Uh, ransomware is ransomware, but um, I thought it was interesting to implicate security researchers in your ransomware. Uh, the last story on the web I'm going to cover is, uh, it's called Science Has a Nasty Photoshopping Problem by editor David, editor David, I guess that's what he calls himself, editor David, I don't know the real name there, but it's uh, on the uh, website slash dot. So uh, Dr. Bick, it says, is a microbiologist who works for Stan Stanford University. Also, he works for the Dutch National Institute for Health. So he happened to notice that there's a problem. Uh, the problem is that there's, there's been some scientific papers that contain errors or fraudulent data and even fabricated imagery. So they basically are fabricating their research results and not getting caught. And that is a systematic problem, systemic problem. Um, the problem with this, I mean, the, the, the real world pain that this causes is that people could unknowingly quote or build upon this research, right? Not understanding that it's a fraud and that the research is wrong. So you think, well, that's academic. Don't they peer review? Well, yes, but peer review is not something that is regulated. It's you peer review whatever you ask to be peer reviewed or whatever ha someone has the time to because peer reviewed is typically underpaid. It's not paid at all, unpaid and, and not considered valuable. So for, for it to detect fraud would be problematic at best. Um, also, there is this relationship among researchers that is very trusting. And it's also non-adversarial. So in other words, if you do peer review someone, to point out the problems in their research would be considered adversarial. And that is not smiled upon in the academic field. So it really is uh, a poison. It calls it a poison, and it is. It's a poison for scientific research, literature, uh, any future papers that are generated that are built upon research where the where the the results have been manipulated uh, is is a is a critical problem, uh, and it goes to well where where's the regulation? Well, there is no regulation. You're on your own to actually look and see if something has been peer reviewed, and if that peer review was valuable, and if the research that was completed was completed in a way that is scientific. Don't just assume it's scientific. You must make sure that it was scientific. And you also must make sure that it's valid. It could be cheated or crafted to, to make a certain uh, result appear. That is something you definitely don't want. In any case, um, they did propose a solution down here, which I thought was kind of interesting. So, so the solution, let's just quote here. It says, journals should pay the data detectives who find fatal errors or misconduct in published papers similar to how tech companies pay bounties to computer security experts who find bugs in software. I thought, how interesting. That would actually make peer review uh, something that you could make money from doing. Um, some people actually make some side income off of uh, these bug bounties. Um, as a technical expert, you can search for these bugs and find them. So, uh, 
sort of interesting set of articles. I also wanted to highlight two um, two YouTube videos that I found. Let me bring them up so that I can uh, show them off. And then you can kind of see what I'm talking about. So this first one. Hey guys, welcome or oh, welcome back to my channel. Stop. Okay, let's look at this. This is, uh, her name is Sandra. It says Sandra Tech and Lifestyle. The title of it is Why You Shouldn't Choose, and yes, I said it right, shouldn't, Why You Shouldn't Choose Cybersecurity 2021. Seven Reasons Why Not Cybersecurity 2021. So she basically describes reasons that you might want to think about before you get into cybersecurity. And I found this compelling. She brings up some interesting things. Um, let's, I'd like to consider them. So let's, uh, let's just go through them. So um, first of all, she works in cybersecurity. Uh, she describes herself as an application tester, best, best, best I can figure out. Um, I think an application tester, like a web application tester. So uh, very likely she spends her day checking the application that her company's made or developed. Uh, and seeing if it has any errors or or uh, violations, uh, does it leak data? What happens when you input the wrong things? Um, you know, application takes a lot of forms, so she does that. Um, so this is reasons to not choose a cyber security cyber security career. What what possible reasons could there be? And I found her view to be honest, um, very likely personal, uh, but worth considering worth considering I don't I don't mean I don't mean any of that in a bad way or a negative way uh, so the first thing to think about is the the negative view uh, that a cybersecurity expert has so if you're doing something right no one knows in other words if you're doing your job no one knows and that's that's an interesting way to think about it, right like if, if no one knows your job right like, what do you tell people you do? Well, you say, I'm a cybersecurity expert. Well, they don't even know what that means. And if you have to describe it further, what are you doing? Well, you're basically trying to find the problems. Find problems in applications, in her case. Or uh, maybe you're attacking applications. Maybe you're attacking websites that they pay you to attack. So maybe if you're on the, uh, the white hat side of things. Or the capture the flag type of operation. That could be your thing. So these are reasons not to choose that. And if you're doing something right, no one knows. However, if you get something wrong, you will not hear the end of it. So there's, there's an inherent stress there, right? So you're doing your job, and no one will ever know anything about what you did until you screw up. So like in her case, if she uh, misses a glaring error or a bug in the software and it gets past her and then the company goes ahead and releases it and then someone else finds that error who's on the hook for it well as she says she might not get fired but it definitely looks bad um, the other thing is that um, sh I guess she spun this as a positive and a negative which is that you are never bored so that could be a good thing right you're never bored However, you are also, that means very little downtime. So in other words, if you're never bored, then that means you never have a relaxation time or a down time. Um, that, that's, that's a real thing. That's a real thing. Always busy. Um, there's also a, let's call it a bar for being able to get into cybersecurity. Now, she has an interesting view of this. She says that the entry bar is very low for getting into cybersecurity. But getting on a good security team has a very high bar for entry. So that probably bears explaining. And she did a good job, which is basically that, you know, to get, the, to, get to the place you want, 
you're going to have to spend your time doing whatever someone else wants first. So, hey, congratulations, you're now a cybersecurity guy. However, here are the tasks you're going to be doing. And they're going to be pretty low level. Um, to be on the good security teams, you know, to be on the ones that, that get more noticed or the more fun projects, well, that's a very high level of entry. So, um, you know, after a decade in the business, you could still have the problem of not feeling accomplished and you have no movement in your career. That's worth thinking about. And she brings that up as a good point. And I think it's a good point, too. Uh, the fact that you only get recognized when something goes wrong and then there's high stress of that type of environment. Wow. Uh, another thing she points out that I think is very true is that um, there are many calls you have to be on. There are many meetings you have to go to. So uh, if you're a person that does not like meetings, does not like phone calls, you don't, you're not a people person, uh, then you're going to stay at that low level. So you won't get on those big security teams where you're going to be in front of a board of directors or in front of a audience describing uh, a particular thing. You know, they're not going to ask you to do that because you're not a people person. So you may find yourself working on only that entry level stuff for a long time unless you're a people person. So um, you just can't. And, and, and the thing is, uh, you're going to find this as you get into any engineering type of a uh, field is that managers think in terms of 30 minute increments but engineers think of four hour increments so you can see the 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 disparation there right the, the separation of that uh, you know so your your managers are thinking hey you've got 30 minutes let's carve out 30 minutes of your time and go do this well that 30 minutes is in the middle of a four hour operation that I am spending to learn about something. And if you interrupt me, I start with zero, right? So you have a, that's four hours, that's a half day. Four hours is a half day. So if you spent a quarter of a day digging into a problem and then someone pulls you out to go to a meeting and then takes you back and drops you back off, are you, picking up right after you where, where you left off hardly you are not so that's the reason that that's a problem and she points it out very effectively but I just want to add that to it um, she also says you have to keep learning you, or you are obsolete so it's one of those things where you really have to know your stuff you have to keep up with it or you become obsolete that's part of the reason that I'm doing what I do where I make this show and I am endeavoring to keep things moving and I'm also endeavoring to uh, get a younger generation involved because there is a problem with that. And that is that uh, when I retire, who's going to take up my work over and over again? I've seen people that are long-term veterans of cybersecurity that leave cybersecurity. And very often, two, three, maybe even five people are hired to replace them because their knowledge was so vast and so deep. So there's a problem there, right? Who can replace me? And I've seen that over and over. Uh, it's a sad problem. So if you want to get into cybersecurity, I would encourage it, but you've got to take these into consideration. Do these bother you? And if these things don't bother you, then maybe you're a good fit. But these are things that you really need to acknowledge because they are very negative and they could affect your happiness in life if, if you do these things. So it's a, it's, it's a good video that really helps uh, you to understand, you know, a real world view of what cybersecurity is. Now, very similar to this article, uh, I found a separate article that uh, was more on the positive spin of it. But, uh, well, I'll just show you. And it is cybersecurity is not. We'll pause him because I don't. I don't want to. Uh, you can go check his page out or his video out. I would prefer that. But uh, the title is called "What You Should Learn Before Cybersecurity: Skills You Need 
and it is by Colin Kelly. What I found most interesting was his opening words. And let me see if I can play those again if we haven't already missed them. Let's see. Cybersecurity is not an entry level field. Right there. Cybersecurity is not an entry level field. Now that is different than our previous video, right? It, it is. So he's, one of them of course is wrong but they are kind of making a good point, right? His point is that it's not an entry-level field if you want to do the things you're planning to do. In other words, whenever you get into cybersecurity, you get into it for a reason, right? Well, you're not gonna see that reason for five to 10 years, right? So it's, that's why he says it's not an entry-level field. It, obviously, it is an entry-level field. You can get into cybersecurity right out of college and come on board our team or whatever, um, and you'd be considered entry level, right? But there are things you need to know. Now he gets into a lot of soft skills that are very important. Um, by soft skills, I mean, you know, interacting with people. Uh, and then he also gets pretty in depth with, um, with technical skills. And he is not wrong about the technical skills he mentions. So, this is something you want to check out. If you say, oh, okay, I want to get into cybersecurity, what technical skills do I need? This is a video for you. He he lays it out. Here are some definite technical skills you need if you're going to get into cybersecurity. Without a, without a doubt. So uh, that's the reason I wanted to highlight it. It was um, a nice video, uh, a nice couple of videos by these people to make sure that, you know, if you're, if you're getting into cybersecurity, um, there are things to think about. And uh, you're not going to be working on the cool things to start with. That's just not the way it is. Uh, I know that whenever I started in the business, um, there wasn't a thing called cybersecurity. It was, I started on the networking side. So I knew networking, backwards and forwards. Yes, I knew the technical. So he mentions that as one of the skills, to, uh, uh, networking. So yes, I came in that door. So I already knew networking. But even in getting into networking, same, same problem. Um, it, 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 I ran into that. In other words, I was the third guy that was hired in the security, or not in security, but networking. So that means that what did I get to do? Well, I got to work on the projects that the other two didn't want to work on. Even when the fourth person was hired, they were hired with other things in mind. So I still had to work on those, on those low-level type projects that nobody else wanted. And I would encourage you to, to do that, to be ready to work on those low-level projects and to do a good job on them, to get, them, to get through them, to learn what you can and move on, and to really tackle them. I did. It worked for me. So I'm, I'm suggesting you do it too. If you get handed a task like that, uh, there's no reason to feel chided, no reason to feel cheated. Just, just do it. Uh, take, tackle it by the horns. Um, it's a good way to uh, get your foot in the door to cover things that aren't so high level so that if you screw up, it's not so it's not such an epic disaster. Um, so it's a, it's a good way of training, good way of easing yourself into uh, the job. So um, that's what I wanted to mention about that. So that brings us back to our how-to instructional. Okay, so in this how-to instructional for this week, I wanted to highlight uh, that there is a part of the uh, first uh, domain of security, which is the security and risk management, and that is personal security. So I wanted to highlight that. Personal security is an aspect of CISSP training. Uh, you do things involving personal security when you deal with employees with contractors, consultants, and even users that you help. Things like candidate screening and hiring. So an employer should ensure that the position is filled by a person that is meeting the job requirements, the qualifications, and the ability to accomplish those, those responsibilities and to uh, master that authority. So it should be clearly documented and complain, 
com- it, it should contain that complete description. The things of uh, like uh, the nature of background checks should be done. Uh, screening processes. So, um, who does those screening processes? Well, cybersecurity could do those screening processes. You should at least be involved in, if you're uh, in a large operation, um, they should involve a cybersecurity person when they decide uh, how to hire people. In other words, background checks. Who should we go to for background checks? You don't want to go to a background check place that's uh, not really performing the work that you need. So candidate screening and hiring, it could include a lot of different aspects of personal security, like identity checks. Uh, you need to verify people's documents, their licensing, their um, certifications, uh, those character references that they put. You need to evaluate them. You need to call. So often, those are not called. You need to verify a person's citizenship. You need to check their criminal records. You need to check their employment history. Uh, the completeness and accuracy of everything in there, plus uh, the curriculum they covered, uh, any kind of academic or professional qualifications, make sure they're correct. Make sure they're from an institution that's registered. Uh, make sure that, that if you're allowed, we'll do a financial history, including any judgments against the person. Any kind of membership in a union or association would be important. You know, know who you're hiring. You know, I, I, that kind of gets into... Uh, their belief system. However, if they are part of a union or an association and have a membership and it's a public membership, then you can learn it. Uh, there's also other personal security type of things you get into, like agreements and policies. So you could find yourself writing policy. You could be writing um, the documents that a person signs when they're hired, like non-compete clauses or NDAs, non-disclosure agreements or AUPs, accessible use policies. You could be the person writing these things. So that's more of your onboarding. There's also termination processes. You could be writing those. So starting and termination processes should be formalized. They should be uh, a a written policy in your organization. Has to be written. You need to establish the processes, like um, give people keys, give them tours, uh, make their badges, get their parking permits done, uh, creating their accounts, their email account, and then, of course, any administrative account, like higher-level accounts, they need to be, they, you know, that that should be a separate document. You should have, here's your email, here's your user account, and then also we need need you to sign this, which gives you your higher-level account. Those will be different. You don't automatically get a higher-level account just because you're in IT or just because you're in cybersecurity. There's also the termination of those responsibilities. Like when you leave, you have to return the materials. You have to return the laptop. Uh, You have to have your admin and and even your normal access rights removed. Uh, There also there are policies dealing with all these things, and then there are also written to the policy dealing with the failures in these things. In other words, what happens when someone doesn't return the material? What happens when an administrative right wasn't removed? Did we go and check to make sure that person doesn't no longer has that access? That all needs to be done. And what about contractor agreements? Well, uh, these agreements have to be signed by contractors. You have statement of work. You have timelines. You have policies for failure. What happens when the co- contractor fails? Do they get paid? How much do they get paid? Um, what access do they get in the organization during the process of when they're building this thing for you? You know, when whatever you've contracted out to them. Once they've completed it, remove their access. That needs to be done. It, it has to be done. Uh, so it has to be thought about. It has to be done. So with that, that completes the how-to instructional. Hopefully... Um, that's just kind of a deep dive into one tiny aspect of um, security, uh, cybersecurity. Next, we'll cover the website web tool of the week. So with that, I will come back here to let me get it ready here. Here we go. 
So this is the website or tool of the week that I would like to highlight. It's called filescan.io. So you can just type that into your browser, filescan.io. So if you're curious about a particular item that you've received in email or you're, uh, you've downloaded from the web, uh, wherever you got it, maybe someone airdropped it to you uh, from another Mac or from a phone or whatever, uh, you can go to this filescan.io website and they will scan that file for you and tell you if it has any kind of malware in it. Uh, so it's worth doing. Also, it will do links too. So if you're if you're on your phone and you're not actually downloading, you're just looking at the link for it, well, you can put the link in here and it will analyze it for you. So this is a great way to, like, just to make sure that uh, whatever you're downloading or whatever you've received is worth a cursory check, right? To, to just make sure that it doesn't contain malware. Uh, it's worth checking. Uh, that is my that is my um, website or tool of the week. I will have a couple more next time. And with that, it closes my show. So again, if you would like to give me some feedback or uh, please, I appreciate a follow. Um, I'd appreciate uh, a follow on YouTube. Uh, subscribe and on Twitch. Give me a follow. Twitter, feel free to give me a follow. Um, I don't do a lot with Twitter right now, but I'm hoping to expand that. So like when I go live, I'll put it on Twitter. Um, I don't typically do that, but I will start doing that soon, hopefully. Once I get all my processes lined out and more formal, I'm going to be doing that. Uh, I'm also making some progress on Twitch as well. So I've got some goals on Twitch. Um, I have already made my goal of 50, 50 followers. So I'm now at 51. So uh, I'm doing well in that, and I appreciate it. I appreciate very much the uh, the follows I get, people just checking me out or whatever, and just give me a follow. That I appreciate that very much. I hope to see more of these things. On honestly, if someone else wants to do a cybersecurity show, I'd love it. Um, I'll give you a little bit of things I'm working on in the future, and that is I'm working on getting an interview lined up. Uh, so I'm going to ask someone to join me, and they're going to join me probably audio, uh, maybe uh, maybe video too, if I can arrange it. Uh, but we're gonna we're gonna go through some questions and answers uh, for someone in that's in the cybersecurity adjacent uh, realm or field field of work. So uh, I look forward to that, and we'll hopefully get that. If not the next episode, maybe the one after that. We'll just see how it develops and how it goes. I do have some personal items coming up very soon that are possibly going to interfere with my schedule for getting these videos out. So I wanted to tell you that next week, uh, Friday, uh, Thursday is not going to happen unless I can get it done early, which um, that's possible, but not likely. It may even be Friday before it actually happens. So I, Friday, maybe even Saturday. And honestly, I could cancel. It just just so happens that that might be the case. Uh, also, uh, the next week after that, which is the 17th, I should be able to do a show. But the one after that, the 24th, um, that one's a question mark right now. So I'd always wanted to make these weekly. And so far, I'm on my f fourth episode now. So yay. I have a fourth episode um, that I've been able to every week come out with. So I'm happy about that. And... I hope to continue that trend. I hope it's a trend, and I hope to continue it. So hopefully um, next Friday I can produce another show, and then in two weeks from there I will be able to produce another one, but I don't know. It may be short. I just, I just don't know. Um, I would hate to make it lower quality. Uh, that is what I'm definitely avoiding, is I do not want lower quality just because something interferes with it. So if I can't make it high quality, I will cancel it. If I can't make it high quality, um, then I won't make it at all. So if it's if it has to be short, that's fine. If it has to be late, that's fine. But just so you know what my thinking is on that matter. So with that, I will bid you good day. Thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate it very much. Leave a follow. Leave a like.
Thank you so much. Goodbye.